Good morning and welcome from the University of Michigan. This is one of nearly 100 video recorded teleconferences we host to advance the safety and sustainability agenda of the U.S. education facilities industry. I am Christine Fisher, accompanied by my colleague Mike Anthony. Today we will be revisiting our February coverage of the National Technology Transfer and Advancement Act with one of our nation's leading experts in technical standards law and the legal milieu that surrounds them. We have Andy Updegrove of Gesmer Updegrove. But first, I would like to welcome uh, any others that are on the call. Well, at the moment, it doesn't look like we've got any, Christine. Go ahead. That's right. Thank you. Um, thank you, Andy, for your time and expertise. I'd like to turn it over to Mike to introduce Andy. Thanks very much, Christine. Uh, yes, it's my privilege to introduce Andy. Andy and I met about three years ago at one of ANSI's annual conferences, and apart from being one of the best in class and a friend of innovators anywhere, uh, Andy also conveys his erudition into political technical thrillers, one of his talents that we'll circle back to. But for the moment, let's have a, a quick look at the um, Gesmer Up to Grow website. Here's one of the websites. You can see that they're very active and well known in the in the high tech industry. But more important, Andy's asked me to uh, put up his website here, uh, consortiuminfo.org. And at that point, what I'd like to do is uh, let Andy explain actually where he's at. I believe he's on the road somewhere between Boston, uh, Boston and uh, Washington D.C. So Andy, uh, please feel free. Welcome and uh, speak freely. Great. Well, thank you very much, uh, both of you, for the kind introduction, and thanks for the opportunity to, uh, to speak to your uh, audience, current and future, uh, today. Um, the site that you are looking at at the moment is something that I have been working on since around 2003. Uh, there is uh, the equivalent of about 15 books worth of content there, uh, arranged in several different ways, and it's a useful resource that perhaps it would be worth taking a moment uh, to go through it. Uh, what you're looking at is the home page, which brings together a number of different features from the site. One is a news feed. Uh, you'll see it's a drop down. Here on the home page, what you're looking at uh, is a number of features, including the news feed. Uh, you'll see that there's a tab at the top of the page that says news. Uh, what I do there is every day I post several uh, items from the news that uh, are relevant to anyone interested in standards. Over the course of the last uh, 12 years, I think there's about 8,300 items there now. All of them are sorted into various categories, uh, political, uh, by technology areas, such as Internet of Things, security. Uh, so it's a uh, research resource as well as a current use tool uh, that you can follow what's been going on in a number of key areas and standards going back to 2003. You'll also see that there's a tab there that says Metal Library. Metal Library uh, is a compendium of over 1,800 articles, mm -hmm. which I've called from uh, various sources around the internet. Again, they are sortable by quite a number of different uh, categories whether it be uh, legal, economic, uh, procedural, antitrust, et cetera. Uh, the, in each case, we'll find that there's an abstract as well as a link to the original source material. Almost all of that material is free. Uh, you can also sort by author, number of times viewed, uh, and quite a number of other ways to search it. Uh, it is very heavily used by academics and government. You could teach a course on just about any standards related topic using uh, only the material from this site as pretty curricular uh, material. So that's the main reason that that uh, resource exists. Yeah. I won't dwell on the other ones too much. You'll see that I have a blog uh, with uh, quite uh, probably about six or seven hundred entries on standards topics uh, and also a very, you'll see uh, the tab will say guide. That's a short book length primer on how to set up a standards consortium, how to choose a standards consortium to participate in, how to set up its technical process, uh, the laws that are relevant to consortia, and much more. Uh, the site receives as many as 10 million views a year. 
uh, often as many as 25,000 views a month just from uh, Beijing. So make use of it. Everything's free. Uh, it's there for uh, study and for uh, uh, research. So with that, by way of a quick um, introduction to materials that will be available to you to go back to after the end of this talk. Uh, for example, in the journal, there's a long article on uh, the National Cooperative uh, Research and Advancement Act, which is uh, the source of our talk today. Now, what is this thing they call the National Cooperative Research uh, uh, Technology uh, Transfer Act? Uh, the NCTTA, as it's usually shortened to, was put into place by government in, 19, in uh, 1995 by Congress in order to shift government away from setting standards itself and to using standards that are created by the private sector in voluntary consensus standards bodies, which is a concept that we'll return to. There are several reasons for this. Uh, one of them was that when government sets standards, it tended to create profiles for products that would not otherwise exist. So that anyone that wanted to respond to a government procurement order would have to design a product solely for that particular fulfillment. Whereas if you use private sector standards, it means that there will already be a wide range of products available that already uh, comply with those standards. So that, so, this means, so that explains the $800 hammer coming out of the Department of Defense? Exactly. Uh, that was one of the examples. Another was the $200 toilet seat. Yeah, uh, we, both we, of them we have an example of the $1,000 football helmet. Well, let's, let's go on. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. All perfectly uh, good examples of why creating what are usually referred to as government unique standards uh, is not a good idea, assuming that there's a private sector tool available uh, to be used instead. <clears throat> so the principal element of the NCTTA are three. The first, and we'll come back to this one in detail because there's some nuances to it. The first is that whenever a private sector standard is available, government has to use it unless it can justify uh, a reason why that uh, private sector standard is not adequate to the test. So that's the first one. The second is that they actually do have to justify it. They have to respond to Congress by and this, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and literally report every year on how many and which government unique standards they are still using and justify their continued use of those uh, standards. And this has now been going on now for over 20 years. The result, I'm sorry, let me finish the, the roster. The third is that government personnel are instructed to take part in the voluntary consensus standard process. So they're instructed to not only be consumers of the standard that come out of this process, but also to be contributors into the process. Now, at a high level, that uh, is fairly straightforward. Like most things that emanate from government, uh, it gets to be a bit more complicated. One of the elements that is somewhat more complicated and continues to be uh, a bit puzzling 22 years later is the, is the reference in the Act to what are referred to as voluntary consensus standards. Voluntary consensus standards are defined as standards that come from voluntary consensus standard body, not theologically. And then a voluntary consensus standard body is an organization that uh, is organized around four main principles with sub principles. And those include uh, being independent uh, and not controlled by anyone. They include uh, operating on a consensus basis, concept we'll come back to. They include having a uh, route of appeal so that if someone is not satisfied with an element of the standard, that there's a way 
to uh, go back and seek uh, a measure of recourse. Now, you might wonder why the uh, government should care whether a standard is the product of such a process. <clears throat> and the reason is because standards represent a sort of shadow world that mimics the legal and regulatory world but operates entirely on consensus. So on the one hand, you have Congress and the judiciary and the executive branch and this enormously complex and expensive process that creates laws. And then you have enormously large and complex and expensive agencies that create regulations. And then you have police departments and federal uh, agencies like the FBI that enforce those laws. And then you have a court system, all of these again, expensive and complex, to punish people. And then finally you have this very expensive uh, prison system. However, there are perhaps an equal <coughs> number of standards in existence. And one of the wonderful things about standards is that with the exception of those standards that are referenced into law, the rest of them are always implemented voluntarily. Nobody actually has to implement them at all. There's no law that says a manufacturer has to make a 60-watt light bulb. They could uh, have a 55 or a 65-watt light bulb. But because an organization set that standard <clears throat> and because industry was allowed to participate in that process in a way that made them feel like it was a level playing field they were working on and that everyone would benefit equally from the results, out came the standard that every single manufacturer in the industry voluntarily follows. So on the one hand, you've got this very expensive, complex, and not entirely effective legal system, and you've got this <coughs> limber, nimble, fast-operating, inexpensive private system, which costs the consumer nothing, and which requires no enforcement mechanism whatsoever. It's really rather magical. Yeah, we covered, uh, uh, we, we had Jim Shannon on the uh, call, not on the call, we featured his, uh, his discussion and he identified NFPA as being one of the, uh, or, or the original conception of the private part, public private partnership. So he does point that out. I just thought I'd let you know that that was the topic uh, last year, uh, excuse me, of last week's teleconference and how many people Oh, I get this. 3,000 people that were interested in that one. So I just thought I'd let you know that uh, uh, we've supported, uh, you know, uh, we, we, our website does feature that particular remarkable characteristic to which you allude. Thanks. Yeah. No, that's a very good segue to my next point. Uh, Jim Shannon, uh, of course, was in Congress and then uh, most recently at the NFPA. And the NFPA is uh, interesting because the majority of its standards actually do get referenced into law. So when you're talking about health and safety, the standard and building codes, which are another element of safety, uh, those standards are very heavily referenced into law. So unlike standards that are voluntarily uh, uh, implemented, those must be implemented. And uh, it saves an enormous cost to government and it also brings in a great reservoir of experts in those fields to knowledgeably create those standards, whereas government would have to acquire the skills uh, in order to do so. Now, the reason I say that's an interesting segue because, is because standards often do get referenced into law. And if they're going to be referenced into law, then uh, Congress, understandably, uh, was concerned about whether they would have had the same safeguards in their origin that a federal regulation would. And a federal regulation, for example, under administrative law, must uh, be announced in something called the uh, Federal Register. Uh, it has to be a public comment period. The public comment period comments have to be taken into account uh, in revisions. Uh, and there are additional steps in that process 
to ensure that anything that becomes binding upon the people has been exposed to the people uh, so that they can comment on it and uh, feel as if they're being fairly impacted by government work. So if you think back about those uh, criteria I mentioned, uh, public body, transparency, ability to comment, appeal process, in effect, what those rules are intended to do is to mimic the requirements of the federal uh, administrative law process applicable to the creation of regulations. So that's why we have this embedded in the uh, uh, Technology Transfer and Advancement Act. So that's all well and good except for one problem. Many of the standards that are created these days in information and communications technology sector are not created by traditional standard setting organizations, such as the NFPA and the 212 or so other organizations, traditional standards organizations, that have been accredited by the American National Standards Institute, NC, <coughs> which uses uh, OMB Circular A119 and the NTTAA principles uh, as a uh, touchstone for their accreditation rules. Or more properly, the NTTAA used the ANSI accreditation principles as a major source reference for creating uh, those uh, rules. Uh, the, rule, the uh, major hand in theme, that, by the way, uh, is Jim Turner, who was a staffer on the Hill for many years, who might, you might have met. And if you haven't, he'd certainly be an excellent person uh, to interview sometime. He'd have a great uh, deal of interesting things to say about the intersection of uh, law and uh, standards and the legislature and standards organizations. So now we have all of these organizations called consortia out there, over 800. And by the way, if you look at my uh, website, you'll see that there's another tab that says list. And if you click on that uh, tab, you'll find the most complete list in existence of ICT standards consortia. Uh, basically, no one keeps lists anymore because of this one uh, exists. It has over 900 standards organizations uh, that exist or have existed over the last 20 years. To the extent that any of them have uh, merged into others, it tracks that. Uh, if they dissolve, it tells you when they dissolve. Like everything else on the site, it's searchable by topic, uh, by uh, business case, uh, by geography, and a number of other uh, ways. But what you'll see there is that out of those 900 and some uh, standards organizations, more than 700 of them are unaccredited by ANC and are not uh, affiliated with uh, the major global traditional standards organizations, ISO, IEC, or ITU. Yeah, I see uh, nine, there's, there's 963 of them here that, yeah. you, that you've that you added here. Yeah, go ahead. Yep. And I'm adding new ones all the time as they're formed, and they continue to be formed on almost a weekly basis. Right. You know, it's funny so, you mention that because the last time we had this, which is February, I'm going to allude to it, uh, and I, I, I raise this because um, I had the pleasure of having Mr. Fred Grable from the International Code Council come in, and he talked at length about ICC's process. So uh, as you're uh, thinking about uh, how organizations and consortia and, and, or, uh, and all, all the other different terms you use for these uh, uh, consensus organizations, uh, the ICC, the International Code Council, is one that uh, that – tends to dominate the new construction space. So if you have a moment, Absolutely. yeah, if you could uh, just enlighten uh, us uh, with their position in the standards uh, uh, landscape. Yes, Thank you. They are, uh, they, uh, I forget whether they're anti-accredited. Uh, there's a little bit of sensitivity about that because if you're a global organization, you don't want to appear anti-centric. So I don't recall whether they are anti-accredited or not, but they would adhere to the same principles uh, as uh, uh, the anti uh, GTA or anti accreditation would refer to. And that is because uh, their standards are so widely taken up uh, uh, around the world for uh, different types of building and other 
or codes compliant. Yeah, the difficulty we have with them, and I, I was frank. Uh, I was frank with Fred. I was honest with Fred, and I said you, the final votes are being cast by building inspectors only, and. Mm -hmm. We find that, you know, Russ Cheney over at IAPMO, we also featured his uh, talk a little bit about how uh, IAPMO's business model uh, uh, permits end-to-end -end participation unfiltered uh, of, of the, what, we call the, what we call the end user, meaning that ICC is one that uh, seems to want to let the final vote be cast by the uh, enforcement interest, the conformity assessment interest, and for our industry, that that that's it's a problem, but, but they they do they do claim, and I, I don't have any reason to doubt them, that the ICC process is one that the Department of Energy has approved as ANSI-like. So when you get into those kind of terms, that's when I ask somebody like you, uh, what is an ANSI-like consensus process with respect to all these other uh, organizations, these standard-setting organizations I see on your list? Right. Uh, good question. Let me uh, sketch in the consortia a little bit first because then I can use it to com compare and contrast the two approaches. <clears throat> Back in around 1980, uh, the traditional standards development act uh, approach was really quite slow. Uh, it could take as long as eight years to set a standard. Everything operated by mail. Everything was done in face-to-face -face meetings. And everything worked very slowly because there was not, in fact, a great deal uh, of need for uh, rapid action. Uh, if you're talking about 60 watt light bulbs or farm equipment, uh, it really doesn't uh, change with the same pace that technology does. So the uh, high tech sectors said, wait a minute, this is too slow. Uh, we need to act faster. And what they started to do was to form their own uh, forums or consortia or alliances, as you mentioned, there's a number of different names, uh, where they could get together and very quickly usually create a single standard that they thought would do the job. And then they would frequently go to an existing accredited organization and say, here, here's a excellent starting point to jumpstart the process and then it would continue through the normal process. Pretty soon, though, the companies realized, you know, why do we really need to take that extra step? And by the way, we're international companies. We don't really want to take it if in the U.S. to ANSI uh, because it will uh, seem too U.S.-centric for international uh, consumption. <clears throat> so what they did was to institutionalize these consortia rather than have them being just incubators for standards. And very soon there were scores, and then very soon after that, there were hundreds. And today, the majority, the great majority of information technology standards are created in consortia rather than traditional accredited organizations. And perhaps the majority of the communications standards are created in the same venue. Increasingly, other uh, Standards in areas like uh, pharmacology are also being uh, done in the same setting. Now, the process that these organizations <clears throat> set up is actually very similar uh, than a traditional organization. And in fact, some organizations, like the World Wide Web Consortia, Consortium, might even be considered to be more open and more transparent and more uh, consensus driven than a traditional accredited organization. So it's not accurate to say that uh, uh, consortia are a lesser breed or an inferior approach to accredited organizations. They're just different. Now, the, now let's get to your question about differences. <clears throat> and one of them has to do with <clears throat> representation and consensus. Although, as we'll see, the differences aren't quite as profound as they might sound. Under the ANSI uh, uh, principles, uh, the accreditation guidelines, a standards working group is supposed to have representation by all affected stakeholders. Uh, so that means that not only vendors, but consumers should be on the committee. And the definition of uh, stakeholders is in some ways fixed 
in some ways variable because the specific types of stakeholders will change depending upon the uh, the uh, particular domain. Uh, as I recall, don't quote me on this, I think that there uh, may be a percentage limitation on how many vendors, but uh, regardless, the principle is that no working group is supposed to be controlled by one category of stakeholders. However, having said that, some immediate uh, problems uh, pop up. What if no, uh, if no one from a particular category of stakeholders is interested in participating? Uh, and this is a real problem because participation in standards organizations uh, is quite time consuming. If you want to be involved, you need to have the expertise to uh, participate knowledgeably. You have to stay uh, involved in what's going on. You have to review materials and you're encouraged to submit. And you also need to uh, vote in order to achieve uh, consensus and quorum requirements. So if you're a typical consumer, uh, it's not that likely that you're going to want to be involved. So in point of fact, consumers are most often represented by proxies in the form of trade associations, consumer-driven trade associations. But there's only so many of those as well. So it's nice to have a principle of represent representation, but it's difficult to achieve in practice. Well, I would, argue, I would argue, Andy, that price signals are act by the consumer, and this is a distinction I try to make, is that uh, consumer price signals, you discover your leading practice, you discover the fair price that reconciles safety and sustainability, for example, through that price. What we deal with in infrastructure markets, and again, we present a $300 billion infrastructure market to, to, to the U.S. economy, is that... Um, it's harder to drive those. We, we, we think we have a way to do it. Uh, we, we're actually in the early stages of getting it done. So I would just say that uh, it, with respect to your statement about consumers are not as, as not as interested, we see a scaling of that in our industry, the education facilities industry, that uh, doesn't seem to be engaged uh, or they don't have. There's a many reasons. We, that's a different teleconference, frankly, why it's not happening. But your point is, yeah, there's a failure of the process when. Uh, and I, I actually I have the ANSI essential requirements. I have that paragraph balance state uh, up on the screen right now. So I'm I'm trying to follow as much as I can your statements, and your your statements are very well documentable. By the way, I, I want to let you know that you're going to say a sentence. I pretty much know where you're coming from on this. So it's a great uh, pleasure uh, to see uh, all that you're saying uh, easily verified uh, in real time on the web right now. Go ahead. Uh, well, one of the problems with representation, <coughs> excuse me, you mentioned uh, facilities. In fact, there are a number of consortia in existence uh, that are uh, consumer driven. When I said consumer earlier, I should have qualified that. I meant uh, individual consumers more than uh, business consumers. Uh, there certainly is representation by business consumers in many types of consortia. Usually not to the same degree as vendors, but certainly it can be, you know, quite significant. And I have a number of, uh, of clients in the facility space, as a matter of fact. One is called OSCAR, O-S-C-R-E, uh, which represents the uh, owners of facilities uh, and those that manage and lease them. Uh, another one is called the Health Product Declaration. Uh, forum. Uh, it seeks to um, uh, uh, document safe materials or incorporation into uh, structures. So there certainly are a number of, uh, uh, of both types of organizations that have significant user uh, input and a few that are even driven by uh, consumers depending upon how you uh, um, Defiant. For example, you can take a look at uh, the major um, uh, insurance uh, uh, organization, which is driven by uh, brokers rather than insurers. And in fact, insurers pay you know 20 times as much to participate, and the strings are controlled, in fact, by uh, the brokers rather than the insurers uh, themselves. 
That's an organization called Accord, A-C-O-R-D. <clears throat> so you can find an example of just about anything in the, in the standards world. So it's probably a, a good for me to mention that any statement I make is a generalization to which there is almost always an exception. But returning uh, to the differences between consortia and accredited organization and how that links back to the TTCA, um, uh, TTAA, excuse me, uh, the consortia are market driven as compared to accreditation driven, which means that they map very significantly to the accreditation uh, rules, but they feel free to vary to the extent that it uh, facilitates the achievement of their goals. So, for example, they rarely actively recruit to achieve balance, but they do actively uh, um, set up their price structure in such a way to encourage participation. So, for example, where a company, a large company, might pay $50,000 to participate at a given level of membership, University of Michigan uh, might be able to uh, participate for $1,500, and a nonprofit trade association might be able to participate for $500. <clears throat> so there's a conscious effort to uh, uh, achieve uh, balance and uh, certainly some degree of recruitment to get there because there's a recognition that because standards are only uh, implemented voluntarily unless they're referenced by law, they have to work for everyone. And unless everyone is involved in their creation, you're likely to um, create a standard for which there is opposition in the marketplace. So standards work best when all classes of stakeholders participate in their development, and this is recognized as readily in the consortium space as it has been in the accredited space. There's simply more flexibility in how it's implemented. For example, I mentioned, beg your pardon, I mentioned before that we come back to consensus. Consensus in the accredited process, in the traditional world, includes the following elements. Everyone uh, at some point will vote. They may vote yes, no, or abstain. If they vote no, they're usually required to list the reason why they're voting no, and more importantly, the changes that, if made, would turn their vote into a yes. And those that abstain are sometimes required, sometimes encouraged to do the same thing. At the end of the process of uh, marshalling all that input, the standards working group then goes back and revises the standard to accommodate as many of those uh, uh, issues as possible. They're not committed to reconcile every issue because what may be good for one type of company may be bad for another, uh, so they're going to make their best judgment about the best way to uh, balance and resolve issues, but at the end of the day, they will have been required to address every single issue. At the end of the day, unanimity is not required, but attention to all negative votes and the reasons for those negative votes is required. In consortia, that may or may not be uh, the case, because as you can appreciate, <coughs> taking that step is, a, is very long. It takes time to accumulate the issues, to discuss them, to resolve them, and then to rebalance. So in the ICT uh, arena, that's excuse me less often the case, uh, and it's also less often the case that there will be significant involvement by uh, uh, consumers, because when you get right down to it, as a consumer, you may care about the safety of your appliances, but you probably don't care about the exact frequency of your Bluetooth radio in your uh, mobile device. So in point of fact, uh, in many, many, many technology standards, <coughs> other than compliance with any trust principles, 
relating to price, there very often will be little or no real relevance to uh, the consumer, at least at the technical level. So now let's go back to our friend, uh, the Technology Transparent Answer Act, and also uh, get back to this thing we referred to as OMB Circular A119. What the circular attempts to do <coughs> is to provide additional guidance to agencies on how to abide by the requirements of the TTAA. And it does so by expanding on a number of uh, points. The TTAA was first, uh, was already, I'm sorry, the OMB Circular was already in existence when the TTAA uh, was uh, created. So it was amended to specifically address those requirements. It was later, uh, I'm trying to remember, I don't think I may be wrong on this, I don't think that it has been amended since, except that about four years ago, uh, for the first time, uh, a review cycle uh, was put into place to address a number of changes in the marketplace <clears throat> that were felt to, be, felt to be fundamental enough that they merited a review of whether the circular should be updated. Uh, I've uh, served on panels convened by uh, uh, OMB on this. I also submitted written uh, comments. You can find them at my website. Uh, many other people did as well. The, uh, the second draft of the uh, proposed amendments came out. Uh, comments were received on that. Uh, it took some surprising directions uh, in that amendment cycle. <clears throat> and it's now back under review. Uh, as of as recently as last week, when I spoke to someone who had been at OMB at the time that uh, this was going on, uh, it's uncertain when those amendments will come back uh, for further uh, uh, discussion or adoption, or in fact, whether it will happen at all. Okay. So just to let you know, I did have up the uh, the original uh, Federal Register statement. Uh, I also have uh, it, was, it looks like a Times Roman. It was uh, a, a revision to a circular 19. It doesn't appears to be undated, and one that seemed a little bit more ominous was one the memorandum from Anish Chopra, uh, Cass Sunstein about the federal principles for federal engagement in standards activities to address national priorities. That one uh, struck us as a little bit menacing, and you're probably familiar. I I'm glad you're referencing all this. I think in the future I'm likely just going to, be, because we're not into this business specifically, we're here trying to get our costs down, I'm just going mm -hmm. to start referencing your your website for some of this background information. So as a consequence of this discussion, uh, I hope we'll get more traffic to your website because I need a clear bandwidth for uh, for getting our first and running costs down. So I just thought I'd let you know that uh, we we do have we 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 do have the documents you're referring to, and they will be you know, as part of the video recording. Uh, do you have a moment to talk a bit about this uh, memo from uh, from Anish Chopra, Miriam Shapiro, and Cass Kassadstein? Are you familiar with this one? Uh, I think so, but read me uh, the sentence again that you mentioned. Well, I think the, 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 the sentence is, it's basically the uh, principles for federal engagement and standards activities to address national priorities. Um, and it looks, uh, it seems to be in the same uh, region as the concepts of the of original circular A19, but it, what it does seem to say is that if you're, um, and, and we, re we read this, as one in which, well, if you don't move in the direction and speed we want, then we, after we've convened as best we can, uh, then we will we will advance our our uh, energy. It's mostly energy agenda, and it goes on and it just says. Uh, so it, it makes all the right noises from a, a political standpoint, but we we do see. Uh, we, we do see, especially in some of the ASHRAE and the ICC standards, uh, a, a heavier hand by the federal agencies on that, which seem to be prohibited by by here. Which is not to say we don't agree with a lot of the 
a lot of the with most of that we're getting paid to, to follow the, the 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 national agenda whether we agree with it or not that's the elected government will follow along and even though so so i just thought i'd bring to your attention we're concerned a little bit about that one but from a practical standpoint um it, it probably doesn't affect us but it does create an atmosphere uh, at least in the education industry, which has kind of an, a complicated relationship with government, is to the degree to which uh, the business side and the academic side, uh, with a different relationship with government, have to have to work within themselves to conform to what's coming down from the federal government. That's just my general statement about how we find it uh, uh, complicated and emotional at times. Right. Well, I think that those concerns largely arise outside of TTAA and OMB A119 uh, because keep in mind that uh, OMB A119 and TTAA only deal with two aspects. One is government procurement. So what standards must the government use in procurement? And to an extent, which standards can it consider for referencing into law? So. Uh, Certainly, the things you're talking about are quite important. They don't live as closely inside uh, the circular. It's also worth keeping in mind that uh, the level of awareness of these two uh, documents within government and the degree of compliance within government to them is somewhat light. Uh, if you were to look at the proposed amendments to A119, they are astonishing if the agencies actually were to do what the amendments say, they would have to take into account in deciding whether to use a given standard its impact on job creation, the fairness of its intellectual property rights policy, uh, whether it uh, had, uh, whether the organization that uh, created the standard was uh, acting in compliance with antitrust laws, and if you think about it, uh, a, uh, uh, a purchase by the Air Force, for example, might include tens of thousands of standards. How in heaven's name could it possibly know uh, what the compliance of each one of those standards did? And in fact, how could it ask the vendor to take out any components that related to that single standard? It's a commercial impossibility. So in point of fact, uh, OMB A119, to a certain extent, is a dead document in that when uh, government agencies go out to procure, or if a congressional drafting committee uh, or bill sponsor is looking for a standard to reference, there's going to be an extremely heavy uh, bias towards adopting the standard that industry has already implemented. Because otherwise, you're going right back to the drawing board and, in effect, saying, we want a standard that will cost the government much more to procure because nobody's building products to it. So there's an inherent illogic fallacy or impracticality to OMB A119 to begin with. That's very similarly, interesting. Very interesting. Uh, yeah. Similarly, if you look at what the administration does, uh, the administration is constantly in sort of a lead and lag mode. For example, if you look at cybersecurity, uh, there's a huge current need for cybersecurity, and yet congressional addressing of those issues is very slow. And again, you need to use the most up-to-date standards available. Uh, so uh, the executive branch and the agencies uh, would always like to, if possible, focus on goal achievement rather than uh, being strapped by factors that will uh, inhibit goal achievement. I should probably pause there because we've covered uh, uh, the, the territory uh, uh, at, at a certain level in one pass, so I should probably hand the baton back to you uh, so that you can ask any questions or if there's areas you'd like me to elaborate. Well, no, it's fairly fully dimensioned. Uh, every time we went in one direction, I could see is the need to go into 20 other directions. It's a large, complicated, move, fast-moving space. I love it that your site shows daily action. Uh, we, we have, uh, we, we have a, a blog site. Uh, we're, we're focused principally on the 
the, the, the cost structures, you know, we have a, we, we, you know, we build $80 billion worth of buildings every year. That's the, that's the equivalent of Microsoft's annual sales. So it's a non-trivial uh, public outlay. And uh, apart from what the University of Michigan has led in, in a relatively organized and effective way, there, there's no voice there. We've built it up over 20 years. But what, to hear somebody else, again, talk about how this is going on out there, whether you care to participate in it or not, we're almost faced with the fact that now we know this is going on, because we've been doing it for 20 years. Uh, now you know it's going on. How can you not be engaged in this process if you want to claim that uh, you're, 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 you're the best possible steward, you cannot not be involved in this process. So, and I think uh, we're grateful that Joe, uh, you know, Joe's coming here to help us support our case. But getting back to your area of expertise, I think where we, uh, what you've helped us understand here is that we're not coming up with this out of nowhere. Uh, University of Michigan started uh, standards advocacy uh, with the uh, with our first vote. I still actually hold the vote for the Association of uh, Facility Managers, uh, but it would, everything was done before by what I'll, what I'll call the enforcement interest within our industry, or was done by academics. There wasn't really any fa uh, facility side uh, representation. So we've been trying to cultivate that over the years and. Uh, but er, even since 1997, when, when we, um, in fact, you can actually see it here on our website, we try to recount our, uh, we try to count our history, we could never have imagined uh, the rate of what I call ferocious streaming regulation now. Uh, you alluded earlier to how slowly uh, leading practice standards development was done back in the 80s. Uh, it's roughly when I started my career compared to what's going on now. It's, it whistles by us on a near hourly basis and your site, your site conveys uh, very much the speed and the size of this and not pe and many people understand or can conceive of it. I think we're making progress with the time you spent with us. Certainly, um, I think the cost of education is very high on the national agenda. Uh, we, we believe that, uh, we believe that uh, this is one of the centerpieces of a cost control of a cost control strategy. There's another more sensitive issue we probably won't have a chance to talk about is that um, even though we, uh, we we have about a 1.2 1.5 trillion dollar industry, only 20 percent of it's in facilities. The rest of it is in professors, salaries, uh, 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 teaching, all the other. All the that that's really our primary business. And of course, in our industry, we have athletics, we have uh, we have uh, research enterprises. But the degree to which the other eighty percent of our industry could be could manage its cost and discover its leading practice through uh, consortia, as you say here, uh, or other arrangements where. Um, thought leaders determine a compromise on what the best way forward is. Do you have some thoughts on on how the education industry in the United States could use these processes you know, that you're familiar with to not only um, reduce its, its bottom line, but also to grow its top line and compete internationally? Do you have any thoughts on that? Sure. Well, first, just an observation that there are quite a large number of uh, consortium and accredited standards developers that are active uh, in the facilities uh, building and management areas. Uh, I mean, a recent area of enormous activity, of course, of LEEDS uh, uh, standards and compliance, which has been uh, quite a uh, dramatic uh, uh, level of not only standards creation, but standards innovation in the marketplace. For those not familiar with it, uh, it has to do with energy efficient, building energy efficiency uh, into buildings and more broadly making buildings healthier. Uh, so there's quite a lot going on uh, in, in that area from many different uh, aspects. I think the, and it's also worth noting that universities have historically been very active uh, participants in standards development activities. Uh, however, it does tend to be somewhat uh, uh, spotty. It tends to be heaviest on the research side, uh, where you would have technical uh, participation in computer sciences or, or uh, pharmacology or 
uh, other uh, scientific areas, uh, but it's not unknown outside of that. And I think uh, the uh, simplest way for uh, universities as uh, owners and managers and lessors and lessees of space is to uh, circle those existing organizations that uh, are making the standards and join them. Uh, as I say, you'll be pleasantly surprised to learn that you can generally join them for a fraction of the cost that a uh, for-profit entity would, and you would have the same seat at the table as anyone else would. So you have the opportunity to join these organizations, to join the working groups that are forming the standards that are of concern, to suggest the formation of working groups that you think uh, are necessary. Uh, so that is something that's available immediately and which can have literally immediate results. Right. Uh, that's, that's, yeah, we did. Uh, we actually, uh, those of us who know that APA, we were, uh, we were the... Uh, uh, we, we, we were actually the driver uh, to get uh, APA to become a standards developer. So there's a long, complicated story about how that happened, but we've been advocating for that. Uh, not just, in, well, it, it really, we put our shoulder into it in about 2005, 2007, uh, but now they are ANSI accredited. There's also another organization called the Simon Institute, um, the Simon Institute that deals with, believe it or not, there's a lot of money in our industry spent on simply on, um, on uh, uh, custodial. It's a very large part mm -hmm. of our part of our industry. Mm -hmm. So, and then we formed a uh, we formed another committee within uh, within IEEE within existing within an existing IEEE where we also formed a. Uh, uh, we call it the Education Healthcare Facility Electrotechnology Committee, and we have a couple other trade associations that we're trying to either uh, become ANSI accredited or engage in this consensus process. Now that I know a little bit more, Andy, some of them may be more suitable to uh, a consortia arrangement, and uh, we'll have to talk uh, off to the side on that. But our our strategy for the education industry as a whole is to get them engaged in these processes, and we think we've got four. Uh, trade associations now working on our behalf, and as you say, the results can be nearly immediate. Yeah. Well, we'd be interested in a, a nice little online resource, excuse me, if, if this doesn't exist at your site yet, would be to do sort of a mini version of my site, of a few elements of my site, which would be to call out of the list that I have up those organizations that are active in the areas that are of interest to you, put them at your site, and then do a select and sort function that says if your interest is as an owner, these are the associations that are of interest to you. If your interest is as a uh, 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 a scientific, you know, you could you could come up, and then you could have it as a way to promote to the thousands of colleges and universities around. Here's how you can find where your voice can be most effectively heard. And if you get uh, five or six universities participating on a work group, that's a large number. That, that's right. That's and, it's, number. and as you say, it's, it can be nearly effective. If, with my experience on the NEC and a couple other committees, I'm also on the NFPA Research Foundation, I like that you said the effect is nearly immediate. Now, immediate in the standards world might mean six years, <laughs> but it's still immediate. You can see how the votes will go. Andy, on the screen right now, I have an organization chart of what I'll call a representative large university. It happens mm -hmm. to be organization chart. And what I've done when you see this video recording, I put a flag, a blue flag, on all of the parts of that organization chart that have a dedicated trade association. And I think I picked up 25 of them. There are others. And in this particular Prezi, uh, it, it's just remarkable. The law school heads a trade association, the general libraries, the unions, the uh, obviously the athletics. So uh, the marketing, there's actually an association of university marketing professionals. And what we've done in this particular Prezi uh, presentation is we've gone through, we just picked 25 of them. 
Um, mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's, I suppose it, 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 it's a business opportunity for people in your organization, uh, in, your, in your market, part of the market. It does present problems for consensus in our industry if there, if there ever will be any. Uh, we, we don't think that there will be. We believe that the University of Michigan strategy for getting the education facilities industry by getting them all uh, into the consortia platform of one way or another, either it's uh, ANSI accredited or, or some other, uh, something that's recognized by a national or an international standards body. So we try to show that uh, APA or even uh, Simon Institute is only one of, I'll just say the better part of 50 trade associations servicing our industry. And I'm not really sure if other industries have that many trade associations. Are, are, are you, would you, could you? Yes or no, but let me ask one question. Uh, that I'm sure a lot of people will be interested. In what way is an educational institution different or its needs and concerns different from uh, any other uh, organization that owns large uh, amounts of uh, space? So, for example, how is University of Michigan different than Kmart or, um, well, say Kmart? You know, what are your concerns different uh, and why will they not be adequately represented by a trade organization that represents facilities owners generally? Well, first of all, there's so many of them, okay? As you pointed out, there's many organizations. What's the one I have up here that are in that space? Uh, Open Standards Consortium for Real Estate. We have a relationship with BOMA, for example, where we're advocating on particular uh, s standards on accessibility and, and egress and very fine points, what I call the important points, the, the, the getting down in the weeds. But I, I don't think we have a, a, a long answer. Uh, the short answer for that is number one, there's a cost associated with stepping foot on a campus, okay? Uh, the other has to do with the risk aggregation, the brand identity of a state. Typically, it's the largest asset owned by any state. Uh, people are feel very emotional about their football team and their football facilities. So it becomes a setting for a whole life in a way that just going downtown isn't. So, I mean, that, that, that's the short answer. Mm -hmm. Well, this, I think the thing that, you know, to someone <coughs> excuse me, who may not have <coughs> thought about the differences before, <coughs> there's sort of two logical, uh, most parsimonious, if you will, approaches. Uh, the first is look at how you're different. Well, both of them begin with looking at how you're different. So in what ways can you be a free rider? and just rely upon the organizations that are already out there to take care of your interests. I mean, for example, uh, you're probably not worried about a university building a roof in a way that's any different from any other building owner who's worried about their roof. Uh, so you can let that one go by unless you want to, you know, grow turf on top of it. Let's leave that aside. Uh, but then you'll have some subset of issues that will be of special concern. So you mentioned access, which of course is legally required, but you might want to set a higher standard. So you might have a higher degree of social consciousness than a commercial entity, which might lead to a, a sprinkling of uh, concerns across multiple areas. So my first step would be to say, in what way are your concerns different? And focus just on those, because you, you can focus then all of your uh, resources on addressing just those differences. And right. then I would sort them into two buckets. The first bucket is where are these concerns already being addressed? For example, you've talked about becoming members of working groups or uh, persuading existing organizations to start working groups. That's excellent. That means you've identified a specific concern, a specific venue, and a specific working group charter that's dynamite. So then you've isolated and come up with strategy for that. <clears throat> but what if you end up with a list of things that don't seem to have a home anywhere? In that case, you might consider starting a consortium yourself if those uh, orphan concerns uh, add up to some sort of a coherent whole. You could then concern, uh, consider starting a consortium. <clears throat> and the good news is, is that if you had say, 10 state universities joining that consortium, you would have enough purchasing power that 
uh, you would have lots of vendors that would then want to be part of it because they would want to be able to have a say in shaping the standards that you announce you're going to use in your own procurement. So that sort of targeted approach and multifaceted approach, uh, you know, should be, you know, the most uh, economical way of pursuing your goals. And it sounds like you're already uh, doing most or all of that already. To, to, we, we've, we've got it started, uh, certainly getting APA and the other trade, a couple other trade associations rolling, creating them, or creating subsets within existing, creating subsets within existing ANSI standards developers seems to be, a, has been an effective path so far, or at least for getting ideas on there. Now remember, um, we're, we, it's a very complicated problem as to why we can't get our people to the table. That's a different teleconference, but you've raised a couple other issues, and I suppose we can talk a little bit offline about that. So we are coming on to about an hour here. Is there anything else? Uh, you know, you've been very uh, exhaustive. Uh, you, maybe you and I know, maybe even Christine know, that you've probably only scratched the surface on this. Not indeed, uh, but I think that we've given a pretty good overview and probably also suggested a number of topics that people might be curious about more about in the future uh, 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 show. Yep, yep. So I guess what I'd like to do is, uh, uh, I guess, is to, is to uh, talk a little bit, of, a little bit about your avocation, if you don't mind. Here, I think we'll, this is the formal part, at least the topical coverage. Um, and I guess I, I, I want to say we can't thank you enough. The, the National Technology Transfer Act is the foundation of, of, of many industries' ability to control its financial destiny. And I, I hope it's obvious that we're doing our level best here at the University of Michigan to use all the tools available to manage our industry's regulatory burden. That includes collaborating uh, with as many other organizations or universities. It's a big, fast-moving story. And it needs the point of view of someone like you, Andy, with the legal expertise. So with that, with that behind us, I hope you won't mind me mentioning something about your avocation in uh, writing cybersecurity, uh, uh, cybersecurity uh, thrillers. I guess what I'm going to do, I've got your uh, page up on Amazon here. Um, I, they're all available, of course, where fine books are sold. I'll only comment that it makes sense to me that uh, Andy, being the truth seeker that he is, is also someone who would, who would use the uh, the tool of fiction to to distill uh, some of the to, to distill and to allow people to uh, engage emotionally with some of the technical problems we deal with cyber cybersecurity? Is is there anything uh, you'd like us? To, I've got your page up here. We have um, the Alexandria project and we have the Lafayette campaign. Is there something? Uh, can we get a quick thumbnail on on each of these, Andy? Sure. Well, picking up on what you just said, one of the things that I've been sure to do in uh, writing these is to make sure that everything I describe from a technical point of view could actually happen. And indeed, about two-thirds of what I wrote in the first book later did happen. And indeed, uh, uh, in the first book, uh, what it's describing is a uh, an international plot uh, that uh, is based upon cybersecurity hacking. In the second uh, book, the Lafayette campaign, uh, what the underlying plot uh, relates to is hacking a presidential election. And if you've been reading the news in the last week, you may be interested to know that the reason that a secret government agency with no name decides the polls must be being hacked is because absolutely implausible candidates announce their uh, desire to become president and immediately jump to the top of the board. So if that sounds a little bit familiar, uh, once again, I've predicted the future, and you can decide whether having the polls being hacked is a more comforting or less comforting alternative to seeing Donald Trump at the top of the polls. Uh, I, individual you know, it used to be that we would always have a gimmick candidate, and I think Pat Paulson used to be the person who would enter and give a little levity to, uh, at those times it was a very serious thing we were dealing with in the 60s and 70s. Uh, now, I think, uh, through the magic of the worldwide inner tubes, uh, we, we can create these candidacies where they had to work a little bit harder back uh, during the Pat Paulson era to have a... Uh, 
uh, let's put a, a, a candidate to, to make us not take ourselves so seriously. But it sounds like you're kind of a, a national security threat here, Andy, with these uh, prescient uh, plots. Well, I, uh, the, the, you wouldn't want to have my next plot happen. <laughs> Let me just leave it at that. And the next one, uh, the, I'll leave you a teaser for this. Um, right now with cloud computing, everything is being now housed uh, in the cloud. So if it hasn't happened already within five years, every bit of research, every piece of software, every operating system of the University of Michigan will be somewhere else. Uh, up where you are, it may be near a wind farm because already 10% of electricity drives computers. So these data farms are going to be situated where um, the electricity costs the least. Uh, and literally everything that controls transportation, all human knowledge, all finance, all government, everything is going to be in eight or ten different uh, enormous multi-square mile data farms. And they're all going to be above ground. I'll leave the rest to your imagination. Oh, dear. Well, I know I'll be getting the Lafayette. I'm going, I'll be in actually be in Geneva uh, and the uh, what's that uh, nice little? Uh, they have a nice little uh, 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 public pool there, right off. It jut, juts out into the lake, and that's where I usually uh, uh, get my sunshine. And my hope is I'll be bringing this to uh, our friends at the IEC and the ISO. And I'll mention this book. I'll have the hardcover version of it for me there, and. Uh, and maybe uh, see you next. I would likely see you at the World Standards Week in uh, in September. So, and I, before then, I'd like to get a review on this one uh, and uh, uh, help uh, help get the, get the story out there. So, Christine, is there is there anything that we missed here? Well, I I think that there's probably more questions than there are answers regarding all of what we've discussed today. Uh, it's been a fascinating listen from, from my perspective. And uh, the, more, the more you learn, the more there is to learn. So it's, like you say, fast moving. Right. Well, my pleasure. Thanks for uh, inviting me to be uh, part of your series. Uh, and I look forward to a further conversation. In, you know, on, on this side of the glass, uh, you're, it's all about coming up with uh, trade secrets and inventions and keeping them secret, whereas on the other side, it's all about sharing things for free, and you gain by giving things away. So it really takes sort of a, a cultural and mental shift for commercial companies to get it. But mm. standards have been around for so long that culturally and institutionally, they do get it, whereas within a university, uh, there's lots of friendly competition, and there is, outside of science, there probably isn't that historical culture of recognizing that there are things to be gained by working together, or less so. Right. Yeah, this is the part of the movie. Uh, the, we're rolling the credits now, and I record, re recorded because there were some very insightful things said. So some of our f favorite movies actually have outtakes that are left the cutting room floor. Um, <laughs> so, so I've got it on, and we'll decide whether we want to add it to. But we, what we have on the screen here is uh, one of our C, what do we call our C suite site, which gives an overview of campuses mm -hmm. and how they're nested cities within cities. You see the University of Hawaii within Honolulu. You see uh, MIT within the city of Cambridge. You see uh, Stanford University within Palo Alto. And Andy's made the observation that the cities within the cities is a characteristic which makes us different than a commercial enterprise like an IBM, which has a lot of far-flung real estate. Uh, we like yep. to think of ourselves as uh, uh, is really a central part of the brand identity of a state at the very least. And, of course, these places, having been to four of them myself, they all think they're mighty special. So, And the funding sources are also multiple and complex because while we do have state and federal funding, we have students who pay tuition, we have donors who donate mm -hmm. large quantities of money, we have university medical centers that are governed by the new health care law and trying to meet those um, costs. So it's varied and 
multiple and and competing priorities. Well, right, to, to, to fill up and uh, to, to add flesh to what she had just said is that university hospitals tend to be the, the provider of last resort, which means that uh, if you're really sick, you're going to go to the state university hospital. If you can't get that done there, maybe you have the, the ability to go to Mayo Clinic or some other place. So the risk aggregation in a university hospital system uh, is, yes. is is different than a than a than a, than a, uh, a well point uh, network of uh, small community hospitals. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. another distinctive characteristic. The other one is the district energy characteristic. These hospitals present thermal loads. Even the campuses themselves present thermal loads, which invites uh, the econo the thermal economics of a district energy system. So uh, we mm -hmm. we can during the big power outage of 2003, we were able to supply power to uh, large parts of the university. Uh, Princeton also did the same thing. We weren't as loud about how they did it as Princeton was. Uh, our system is about 10 times as large, but we still, that district energy system was uh, a feature that was unappreciated until we lost Detroit Edison power. So again, another reason why uh, we believe cities within the cities uh, uh, need uh, a, a, an active standards engagement uh, culture, so as you as you mm -hmm. mentioned, mm -hmm. well, certainly maybe one of the biggest things uh, um, ways that you can be most effective is simply highlighting easy and logical ways for other universities to get to be involved, so that rather than dealing with it as a concept, they can see specific actions they could take that might have uh, uh, near-term benefits. Uh, yep, that's what we're doing. Okay, then I guess you hear you're still on the road, and we need to, to to close this out so our video guy doesn't complain about the size of the file. All right, <laughs> okay. Okay. This, this time for Thank sure we'll hang out. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.